Well, are you ready? Open your Bibles to the book of Daniel. We'll begin our journey through Daniel, and I am very excited about the journey that we are about to begin for many reasons, and we'll spend some of our time tonight talking about why this is such an exciting course of study. It would be ridiculous to say it's a journey of biblical proportions, because they all are, amen? But it's interesting that Daniel is to the Old Testament in the mind of many, what Revelation is to the New. Now, what makes our journey exciting, at least in one part, is that we're going to examine both fulfilled prophecy and unfulfilled prophecy, things that lie ahead in the future, and in the heart of all that, we're going to find God's plan of redemption for mankind, redeeming him from his fallen state. Now, in the chapters of Daniel, 12 in total, nine of them are going to focus on dreams and their interpretation, which obviously makes Daniel a book of vision or a book of revelation, if you will. And they are concerning our age that we live in today, as well as those prior to us. The age of the Gentiles is within the framework of the book of Daniel. Now, Daniel also has some rather interesting literary features in that it's written in two main languages. It's written in Hebrew, and it's written in Aramaic. The first chapter and up to chapter 2, verse 3, is written in the language of Hebrew. Then, in the middle of verse 4, the language switches to the diplomatic language of the day, that being Aramaic, and it continues to be written in Aramaic, all the way up to and through chapter 7. Then in chapter 8, Daniel switches back to writing in Hebrew as his subject matter turns from not the pagan king and pagan nations covered in in chapters 2 through 7, but rather to his people and city that we have recorded for us in Daniel chapter 9. The subject matter returns to the nation and people of Israel. Now this is a subtle but notable point that's going to become more incredible as we make our way deeper into these chapters. Now it's interesting that Daniel also includes 21 Persian words. So we see the influence of the Persian captivity uh, in Daniel's writings as well. And the first of those 21 Persian words will be in our verses this, this evening where we're going to find in verse 3 the word nobles. We're also going to find three Uh, Greek transliterated words, meaning they are Greek words that are not translated, and they will all be in reference to musical instruments. So Daniel is quite the scholar. Many say he is unparalleled in Scripture except possibly by Moses and Paul. He uh, speaks multiple languages, writes them, understands them, as is obvious by the things we just mentioned. Now, the book of Daniel is not without its critics by many who claim to be Bible scholars yet don't believe in prophetic revelation. Now, the argument is made that nobody could write the things with the accuracy in which Daniel wrote without having written them, having an understanding of them after they had happened or when they had happened. So many say that Daniel was not written in, in the uh, 5th century B.C., but rather it was written in the 2nd century B.C. when the heart of the prophecies from chapters 2 to 7 had already been fulfilled. Now they make the argument that no one could write such things unless they wrote it from the perspective of history. Now they would have to include in that no one the Holy Spirit since he wrote all the Bible, amen? And he could see the future as clearly as you and I can see the present or the past. Now, there are two problems with the historical perspective of the book of Daniel, looking at it as a book of history rather than a book of prophecy. Now, one of their two problems is greater than the other. The first problem is some of what Daniel has written has yet to be fulfilled. So how can it be written after the fact when the facts aren't even complete yet? And what we do know is that what has been fulfilled assures us that what has not yet been fulfilled is going to be fulfilled with the same accuracy as the things we will, we will study in later chapters. Now, the second problem with viewing Daniel's writing as not prophetically but historically written in the 2nd century B.C. is this. 
In Matthew 24, 14, Jesus said, say Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the what? The prophet standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, he's talking about the Antichrist who stands in the most holy place and claims to be God. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, Again, Jesus didn't refer to Daniel as Daniel the historian. He referred to Daniel as Daniel the prophet. So if Jesus said the book is prophetic, I'm going to stick with him. Amen? Now, we also need to note that like Revelation, Daniel does not stick to what we might call a linear chronology. In other words, it isn't just a straight line through a period of history, but it goes back and forth much like the book of Revelation does, and it's not in a strict sequential order. Chapters 1 through 4 happen in uh, sequential order. Then after that, Chapter 7 and 8 take place in history. Then after that, chapter 5 takes place. Then after that, the events recorded in chapter 9 take place. And after that, the events in chapter 6 take place. And then finally, in 10 to 12, those uh, events recorded there happen in sequence. So if you're looking to organize the book of Daniel in sequential order, you would do it as follows. 1, 2, 3, 4, 7... 8, 5, 9, 6, 10, 11, 12. That's the sequence of events that are recorded in the book of Daniel. Now, there's another point that should be of great interest to you and I as well, and it's another nail in the coffin of the historical view, if you will, and that's found in the closing verse or chapter in a very famous verse, that being Daniel 12, 4, where Daniel is told to shut up the words and seal the book until when? Until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now, there's some debate as to what that phrase means, knowledge increasing. Does it mean knowledge in general, or does it mean knowledge of the prophecies of Daniel? And the answer is yes. It's exactly what it means. Now, think about this. How can you write of the time of the end from a historical perspective when the time of the end hadn't come yet? And Daniel and Revelation are both prophetic in nature. And Revelation was written to the church about the last days. And Daniel was written to the uh, chosen people of God who live in the last days. And the second century B.C. is not in the last days. Somebody say amen. Now, we also need to note that Ezekiel was a contemporary of Daniel, and that's why his writings are often apocalyptic, and we have the great battle that takes place, I believe, during the tribulation of the Ezekiel War, that which is recorded in 38 and 39, and just as kind of a bonus point, I say that for this reason, we know that the Ezekiel War is ended by God. There's a great earthquake, and there's hailstones of fire which that type of activity is specific to the tribulation period. And therefore, it's going to happen, I believe, early in the tribulation when God begins the time period known as the tribulation or the 70th week of Daniel, where God will fight, as Zechariah said, against, fight as he fights against those who have fought against Jerusalem. So we have Ezekiel writing about tribulation events. We have Daniel writing about the same time period. Now, both of these men were taken into Babylonian captivity. Daniel was in the first deportation in 605 B.C. The letter actually begins to be written in 602 B.C. and covers all the way up to 523 B.C. Daniel was in captivity for the whole of the 70 years, and Ezekiel was taken captive in the third invasion of the Babylonians of Jerusalem when the temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. Now, that tells us that this was a season of rich prophetic revelation, much like the time of Jesus, much like the time of uh, Israel and the Exodus. There was much being said, many things being done that were of a miraculous capacity, so to speak, that was unveiling the plan and purposes of God. Now, in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, we're going to hear about the first year of Darius, or Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. That's another name for the Babylonians. In the first year of his reign, 
I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through who? Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. In other words, he understood the captivity would last for 70 years. Now, Jeremiah had spoken on behalf of God that the captivity was in the future for Israel if they did not repent. And the sins that God was calling them to repent of could be summarized under these three categories. They were idolatrous, they had committed infanticide, and they were not heeding the word of the Lord. Now, we know specifically from Exodus 23, 10 to 11, that God gave a mandate. He said, six years, you shall sow your land and gather in its produce. But the seventh year, you shall let it rest and lie fallow. This is called the sabbatical year. That the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave, the beasts of the fields may eat. In like manner, you shall do with your vineyard and your olive grove. Now, with this, God made a promise that he would double the increase of the six years' crop so the people wouldn't starve to death, and he would provide for them uh, double, twice in the sixth year what they needed to cover the seventh. Now, in this sabbatical year, the children of Israel had forsaken it for 490 years. In other words, they ignored the Lord's command to rest. Now, I know it's late, but we can still do some simple math here tonight. 490 divided by 7 is 70. So God took back those sabbatical years from the nation and sent them into captivity and used the Babylonians as the mechanism to do so. Now, he allowed the land to rest, taking back those years that they owed him, which reminds us that God means what he says. Amen? Amen? God means what he says, and the word of the Lord is sure and is to be obeyed, and disregard for the word of God always has consequences. Now, it's also worth noting to those who would say, well, isn't that a little bit extreme? All they did was plant in the sabbatical year when they weren't supposed to, but it wasn't just that that they were guilty of. They were also not only forsaking the sabbatical year, the idolatry of the Israelites had become so prevalent that they had adopted the practice of offering their infant children to the god Marduk, who was the Babylonian god, an iron arm statue whose arms were superheated until they were red hot, and parents, as an offering to Marduk, would lay their infant children and listen to them being burned to death. And God had said that he had not ever imagined such a thing. Now, in Romans 1, 28 through 32, Paul writes this. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, this is what Israel had done, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, I would say infanticide is unrighteousness, amen? amen. Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they're whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things like abortion, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are what? Deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Babylon was the birthplace of idolatry. The Tower of Babel was built there, as we all know that story and what led uh, to that and the uh, aftermath of that, God scattering the people and confusing their languages. And it's almost as though, as it records in Romans, that the Lord said to Judah, you want idolatry? Well, here you go. I'm going to move you to the place where it was invented. Now, history tells us that after the Babylonian captivity, the children of Israel never returned to corporate idolatry again. And that is so even to this day. So it, it was for Israel's good and for God's glory that he sent them into the captivity to bring an end to idolatry forever. Now we also know from Hebrews 12, 11, that no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. Anybody know that that's true? Of course it's not joyful for the present, but painful. 
Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And the Babylonian captivity trained Judah not to forsake the commands of God, not to commit infanticide, and not to worship false gods. And God's chastening, though certainly unpleasant, was training his people in these things. Now, we also know, as we mentioned, that the book was sealed until the time of the end. And that would be a time where what was written was going to come to pass. And it's interesting as we make our way through Daniel, even in what we've uncovered thus far, that we live in a day where the word of God is not heeded. We live in a day where children are being sacrificed. We live in a day where idolatry is rampant, and therefore there just might be something for us in the study of the book of Daniel. Now, through Nebuchadnezzar's invasions of Israel, the subsequent captivity of Daniel and his friends that we'll talk about, or at least be introduced to tonight, and the tactics that are employed by Nebuchadnezzar to transform these young men into Chaldeans, we can identify, and here's our title tonight, and it is an acronym, our title is, and all you police officers will enjoy this, our title is SWAT, Satan's Weapons and Tactics. Satan's Weapons and Tactics is what we'll be exposed to here tonight, and this scenario, as I said, beginning in 5, 605 B.C., exposes for us that the actions of Nebuchadnezzar clearly parallel those of the enemy being deployed in our day. Now, we're going to find some stirring realities, I believe, in our text, and they will remind us again that we have an enemy, yet we have the power in Christ to resist him. So let's examine Satan's weapons and tactics in an effort to recognize and resist them that he might flee from us, as James 4, 7 promises to us. So would you stand and read the opening words with me of this incredible, inspired word of God known as the book of Daniel. We'll read verses 1 through 7 tonight and find Satan's weapons and tactics. Verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the house of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, there's the Persian word, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king had pointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave the names, gave names rather. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abed, Nego. The Father, once again, we ask your blessings on this journey as we begin this incredible book as it reveals, Lord, events from the past and points to events in the future. And give us understanding again, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, we'll probably correct a little of our Western culture pronunciations here with some of these names. We often uh, have pronounced them the way that we would, but we have to remember these names are either Hebrew or they are Chaldean, so we'll probably move back and forth between the familiar pronunciations and just for our own understanding, we'll pronounce them as they should be. Now, while we recognize that the captivity of Judah was ordered and orchestrated by God, we equally know that whatever God does, Satan tries to subvert it, or he tries to pervert it. Now, based on the fact that there are three things, based on that fact, I should say, there are three things that we're going to find 
in our text tonight that are being employed by the enemy in our day that are also found in these verses through Nebuchadnezzar's efforts to deal with these young men that he want, wanted to serve in his courts. Now what we're going to find are these things. We're going to find Satan's agenda. We're going to find his prime target. And we're going to find his most effective tactic. Now, he hasn't changed any of these things. His weapons and tactics remain the same since the garden because these things have been effective in deceiving multitudes down through the ages, including during the Babylonian captivity. Now, we know that's true because there were far more than the famous quartet of Daniel of good-looking, smart young men that were brought over from Jerusalem to serve the king. Many of them did not adhere to the things that Daniel did that we'll talk about next time we're together in two weeks. Now, the first thing we need to notice in verses one and two, and it's Satan's agenda, and it's agenda, his agenda yet to this day. Now, Jeremiah is gonna help us see it as well as he was commanded by God to write down his prophecy on a scroll, and then he was told to give it to Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, the one mentioned in verse one of our text. Now in Jeremiah 36, one and two, it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, take a scroll of a book and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel, against Judah, and against all the nations from the day I spoke to you from the days of Josiah, even to this day. Later in the same chapter, in 22 to 24, we're told that the king, Jehoiakim, was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month with a fire burning on the hearth before him. And it happened when Jehudi had read three or four columns that the king cut it, this is a scroll Jeremiah wrote, with the scribe's knife and cast it in the fire that was on the hearth until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were not afraid, nor did they tear their garments the king nor any of his servants who heard all these words. Now, this is what King Jehoiakim did with the word of God. He took a knife and cut the scroll into pieces and threw it in the fire. And this is the disregard and disrespect he had for the words of Jeremiah's prophecy. We know also from chapter 36 that the scroll warned of Nebuchadnezzar's coming, of the Babylonian invasion, and that he was coming to overthrow Jerusalem. And through Jeremiah, Jehoiakim had actually been offered the opportunity to live by surrendering to the Babylonian army because God said, I am going to reclaim the 70 sabbatical years forsaken by Israel. Yet Jehoiakim's disrespect and disregard for the Lord is obvious in his actions. Then later you'd find in Jeremiah that this disregard for the word of God actually cost him his life. And after he was killed, his body did not receive the respect due a king in Israel, but he was given, the Bible says, a donkey's burial. His body was thrown on the dung heap outside the city, a disrespectful act for a king, something due or worthy of a criminal. Now, verse 2 gives us a point of interest in that it tells us some of the articles of God were carried away to Babylon specifically to Shinar, it's Shinar, that's how we would uh, properly pronounce it. Shinar is the place where the Tower of Babel was built, and it's the birthplace of all cultic religious systems. But note where Nebuchadnezzar takes the articles of the house of the true and living God. Now, a book published in 1956, known as the Babylonian Chronicles, says there were 580 articles taken by Nebuchadnezzar to the house of his God. And he takes him not to his house, but to the house of Marduk. And Nebuchadnezzar's actions were a statement made to the captives as well as to all the Babylonians. And he was symbolically giving credit to Marduk for his victory over Jehovah. Now, there's a point we need to make here in that God, again, being sovereign in all things, allowed this plan to come to fruition and Nebuchadnezzar is even referred to by Jeremiah as the Lord's servant. Now he's not the servant in the sense that we would think of, but he was used by God to punish Judah. Now there is some uh, evidence that Jeremiah or uh, Nebuchadnezzar actually did come to his senses 
and come to know the Lord later in life. But we'll talk about that when we get there in 2019. Now, this points out what is and always has been the enemy's agenda, and we can see it as Satan's weapons and tactics. Now, here's his agenda. Listen, just simplistic truths, something to observe. The devil's agenda is always to rob God of his glory. The devil's agenda is always to rob God of his glory. Think about what we know of the fall of Satan. From Isaiah 14, 12 to 15, the prophet writes, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like who? The Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, the lowest depths of the pit. Satan has always sought elevation above God. And from the Garden of Eden to his eternal destiny in Gehenna, this is going to be his agenda. Now think about it like this. In Psalm 19.1, we're told the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his what? His handiwork. It shows that God is creator. If we examine the heavens, we can see that God is glorious in his creative abilities. So what has Satan done in our day? He tries to rob God's glory by carrying the glory of God as creator to the temple of Darwinism. He tries to rob God of his glory and diminish the glory of God and exalt the uh, natural order of things as materialism or Darwinism presents. Psalm 115.1 says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name do what? Give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. Now, there is only one name that can save, and we talked about it on Sunday. And someday, every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that. Who's the Lord? Jesus Christ is the Lord. There's only one name that can save, and therefore, there's only one name that is due glory. And Satan tries to rob the glory of God by raising up other religious belief systems and names and claims them to be roads of salvation, again, seeking to disparage and discredit the word of God. Now, some say there's reason for us to doubt the Bible's accuracy because of what's written in Daniel 1.1, where Daniel says, in the third year of Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem. Now, Jeremiah says that it was in the fourth year in Jeremiah 25.1, and the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the king of uh, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Some like to make a big deal out of this and point it out as an error in the Bible or a discrepancy, and there's actually no discrepancy at all. The fact is, Daniel is using the Babylonian method of date reckoning, and Jeremiah is using the Jewish method. The Babylonians counted the first year of a king as his year of ascension. And they only began numbering his years when he had served a full calendar year. So if a king uh, began sitting on the throne in our calendar month of December, it was not counted as a year of his reign. Jews, however, counted any portion of any given year or any given day for that matter as part of the whole. And their counting method began, if someone rose to the throne in December, that was year one of their reign, even though the following month began a new year, January on our calendar would begin their second year of reign. Now we know this is true, and it's even evidenced by Jesus being three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus was not in the tomb for 72 hours. He was not in the tomb for three full calendar days. He was in the tomb parts of three days. It could be one minute of day one and one minute of day three with 24 hours in the middle, and it would still be within the Jewish method of reckoning time. Now, we also know the glory of God's creative power is shown in each life that is born. Therefore, is Satan attacking the unborn today? 
So he's doing all that he can to discredit and even sometimes using biblical scholars to point out what some believe as errors in Scripture. And he continues to attack and seeks to rob God of his glory through his efforts to destroy human life and lead people astray. Think about this as well. The glory of Christ's love for the church is portrayed by every marriage between a man and a woman. So what is the devil trying to do? He's trying to pervert what? Marriage. He's after anything that glorifies God. And we could well look at the articles of silver that are carried away, the articles of God, I should say, that are carried away as the doctrines of the Christian faith. They're being carried away to pagan temples today, and glory is given to anything but God in our day. This is the devil's agenda, just as it has always been. Now pick it up again in 3 to 5. We'll talk more about this character introduced to us as Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the child next time to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of who? The Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time, they might serve before the king. Now, the historian Josephus believes that all four of the young men named in chapter 1 were members of King Zedekiah, who was uh, Jehoiakim's replacement. They were members of his royal family. Now, this is possible in light of the mention in verse 3 of nobles and descendants of kings. But it's also worth noting there's some implications in what's in front of us in the fact that there were, as we mentioned, undoubtedly far more than four young men carried away into captivity. Yet at this time, only four are mentioned later in the chapter as having taken a stand for God. Now what that implies to us, I believe, and what that ought to remind us of is that in the last days, it will be as it was in the days of Noah, where the righteous on the earth will be relatively few in number. In Noah's day, how many were there on the whole planet? Eight righteous. Now, it's clear that what Nebuchadnezzar was looking for in these men was both spiritual wisdom and dedication to what they believed. And he sought to use this uh, foundation to his advantage by offering them the king's delicacies and wine and simply take these young men or win them over to the dark side, so to speak. Now, the first thing for us to take note of is that these were teenagers that Nebuchadnezzar was after. Now, that has some application in our day as well, as we'll see in a moment. Now, remember what Paul said in Colossians 2.8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through what? Philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of what was Nebuchadnezzar trying to teach the boys? The traditions of the Chaldeans according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was trying to take the dedication of these young men and simply migrate it over to Marduk, his god, using Chaldean philosophy and empty deceit. Now, he chose the best and the brightest and the faithful as his target. And it's interesting that he focuses on their appearance as well. He says they must be good-looking, knowing that a good-looking, smart group of young men would attract other followers. Now, we know Satan roams the earth today like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Amen? But we also know, with a quick glance through history, one of his preferred targets. And listen, here's our second observation from our text. Satan's preferred target is the hearts and minds of the next generation. Satan's preferred target is the hearts and minds of the next generation. Now now think about what we have in front of us. He didn't bring in the ruling class. He didn't bring in the current nobles. He didn't bring in the current family of the king in the sense of those who were actually already ruling. He went after their children. He said, bring me the children of the important people of Judah. Now, he was trying to determine the future. 
Now, the enemy has chosen young men and women as his prime target. As we know, Daniel, at this time, was somewhere between 13 and 17 years old. He had to be a young man, and uh, scholars report that he was somewhere in his early teenage years, but we also know that his writings lasted for some 70 years, so that in and of itself demands that he was a young man. And also, by the way, just as a side note, eunuch, though the word can mean to castrate, does not mean these boys were physically made eunuchs because the Hebrew word can also mean a minister of state. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar wanted to use these good-looking, smart, and faithful young men for. Now, think about what's in front of us here. He uses the educational system in his efforts to convert these men, these young men, to his God. He gives them three years of schooling. You can do a lot of damage in three years of schooling. You can harm the minds of young people in three years of schooling. It's happening all over our country and world today. He also, in his weapons bag, uses wine and delicacies. The word delicacies means rich food, which is an effort to exploit the young men's vulnerabilities and to win them over through pleasure. Wine to lower their defenses and open their thoughts to things outside of what they had always believed. This parallels what Paul talks about concerning the last days in which we now live. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5, Paul writes, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of who? Themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of who? God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Now, if you hold these verses up against what the boys are facing here, we can see what Nebuchadnezzar is trying to do. He wanted to take their godliness and morph it into loyalties to another deity. Now, this also has application in our recent history, world history, that is. For Adolf Hitler was often heard to say, Capture the youth, and you have captured a nation. Now, we know who Hitler served, and it wasn't the God of the Bible. He served our enemy, Satan. Now, I want you to consider the enemy targets today. He targets the unborn. He's killing children in the womb. Listen, let me just say this tonight. Abortion is demonic. It is absolutely demonic. It is of the devil. It is not something any thinking person would choose to do. Now, God can certainly forgive, and he does. Amen? And he can heal, and he does. But the fact is, this is something that the devil has stirred up because it's the best and quickest way for him to defeat children being raised up to glorify God. So look at who he targets today. He targets the unborn. Let me ask you, is he targeting students today? Absolutely, he is targeting students. Is he targeting marriage today? Well, I would also point out that the vast majority of people who get married today are young people. So he is attacking them in that way as well. Now listen, Satan also is fully aware that 80% of people who give their life to Jesus Christ for the first time are teenagers. So who's he attacking? He's attacking young people. He is attacking the next generation. Now, obviously, God has always been aware of this. That's why he said to Titus, through the Apostle Paul in 2, 6 to 8, likewise exhort the young men to be sober-minded. And sober-minded means not drunk. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. That one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Now notice that Paul's exhortation is not to the young men, but it's to those who have an influence over the young men. Specifically to Pastor Titus. He says, exhort the young men to be, uh, be an example of good works. Exhort them to be faithful to doctrine, reverent by using incorruptible and sound speech as an example to them. Now we're going to deal with what we're to do in response to the enemy's advances next time we're together when we examine Daniel's commitment to no compromise. But listen today, parents, men and women, Satan is after 
the hearts and minds of the next generation. So we have to ask ourselves, is our home one of enemy delicacies? What appetites are we creating in our households? We have to stand and fight for our children. Amen? We have to stand and fight for our children. The devil is trying to take over our schools, and we need to stand up and say, you can't have them. The devil's trying to take our children's hearts and minds and lure them into the temptations of the vulnerabilities of their age. And we need to say, no, you can't have them. And we do this by sound speech, the integrity of our doctrines. Not asking them to do things we don't do ourselves or telling them not to do the things we practice. And there's a war for our sons and daughters and our grandkids, men and women, and we need to be fighting for them. And we've seen the enemy's agenda. We've noted his preferred target. But what about his age-old tactic? In 6 and 7, we're told now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Ezriah, Abed, Nego. Now, we've touched on a couple of the enemy's tactics or strategies, but there's one overriding tactic he uses to this very day, and we'll highlight it here in a moment. Now, his strategies or his weapons of choice are wine and the rich food, which are basically types of the lust of the flesh. He seeks to exploit natural God-given desires and take them to unnatural proportions. Now, this tactic is revealed by how these men are named. Now, Daniel's name, if you want to jot them down, we'll pop them up on the screen. Daniel's name in Hebrew means God is my judge. Belteshazzar means may Bel protect his life. Hanania means Jehovah is gracious. Shadrach, the Chaldean name, means command of Aku, and Aku was a Babylonian moon god. Mishael is actually, his name is a question, and we would translate it as Michael, who is like God? And his name was changed to Meshach in Chaldean, which means who is like Aku, who is the moon god once again. Azariah, his name means the Lord helps. His name was changed to Abednego, which means servant of Nebo. And Nebo, by the way, is Baal. And this tells us what the enemy has been trying to do and what he has tried to do through the ages and has had some success in doing so. And Nebuchadnezzar's desire was to leave the sense of power in the name of these men, but to revise the source of their power, attributing it to his own gods. Now, in John 19, 7 through 11, we're told the Jews answered him, We have a law. According to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and he went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? And Jesus answered, You could have no power at all. Unless, against me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Now, here's what I want you to take away from that scene. Satan wants us to think he has more power than the Father. Satan wants us to think that we can't win our kids back. Satan wants us to think that the battle is already over and that it's too late. Satan wants us to think that that loved one is never going to and can't ever come to Christ. He wants us to think that his grip is stronger than that of the Lord's. He wants us to think that there are things that he can do that God cannot stop. But he has no power that God has not allowed. And this is what Jesus says to Pilate. You wouldn't have any power against me at all unless it had been given to you from above to fulfill, obviously, the purposes of his coming. Now, that means Satan's tactic can be summarized as this. Listen, Satan's favorite tactic is convincing God's people to live indistinguishable from the world. That's his favorite tactic. He's been trying to do it 
since the garden. His favorite tactic is convincing God's people to live indistinguishable from the world. Now, let's break down the strategy, once, strategy, 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 once again, or strategery, isn't that how that floated around for a while? Now, look at his strategy once again. What's he say? Eat the delicacies, the rich food. Drink the king's wine. Not something that comes in a box, but something that comes in a hand-painted bottle or a carafe. What else does he say? Learn the language. Read the literature. Chain, or train for three years. Change their names. Serve in a pagan king's palace. Now notice that Nebuchadnezzar did not send them into a heavy deprogramming of the Jewish faith. He simply sought to inundate the young men with his faith. He wanted them to serve in his palace. He wanted to use the good thing, a dedicated spirit to what they believed, to his own advantage. And this is a major move that is going on in the midst of world religions that we have made mention of on Sunday recently, and that is to explore the common ground between religions. There was even a document that floated around some years ago that was signed and exchanged between Muslim imams and hundred, hundreds of evangelical Christian pastors. They sought to bring the two groups together, celebrating our common ground rather than fighting over our differences. Now, the common ground that they established in this document signed by Muslim imams and supposed Christian pastors was this. We all worship the same God. Is that true? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, the God who authored this book says this. 1 Chronicles 16, 26. For all the gods of the peoples are what? Idols, but in contrast, the Lord, Adonai, made the heavens. Now the devil is seeking to diminish the people of God to just another of the many world religions, all of them sharing common ground, and the voices of our day are crying out for the acceptance of all faiths. The world, the enemy, is simply asking the church to blend in, which is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar is trying to do with the boys here. But let me remind you of 1 John 4, 4 to 6. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us, and he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of what? Error. Listen, all religions can't be right. They conflict with one another. Somebody has to be right. And it's us. Amen? Now, the devil has convinced many in the, many in the church today that you have to speak the language of the world in order to reach them. That's why we have, there was even a pastor, a young pastor, sadly, that carried with him the moniker there for a while as the cussing pastor. What a shameful Label to be known as the cussing pastor. Talk about oxymorons. Many today are saying you have to indulge yourself in the things of the world so the world sees that we're not different. That's not what the world needs to see. The world needs to see we're completely different. And many today have said it's okay to learn and use other means as a way to reach God, which is Satan's tactic to get us to look more like the world. But we're not of the world. We're not supposed to blend in. We're not supposed to speak their language. We're not supposed to dress like the Chaldeans. We're not supposed to learn their ways through their literature, follow their lusts and their passions. We are the people of God. We're the people of the true and living God. And Satan has been trying to rob God of his glory since the beginning. His preferred target, young people. Young hearts and minds. He's always after the up-and-coming generation. His unchanging tactic? To make how we live and what we believe something indistinguishable from anything else, or in other words, for us just to blend in. Listen, our nation and our world is plunging deeper and deeper into idolatry, infanticide, the murder of children, the tolerance of evil, 
reminds us that a weak, compromised commitment, undistinguishable from anything in the world, is not going to be able to stand in the evil day. And Galatians 6, 7 to 10 tells us, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap what? Corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Church, there's a season coming where our nation and world is going to reap what it's sown. The blood of countless millions of unborn children is crying out to God for justice. And the blood of the martyrs joins in their cry. Our nation has gone spiritually blind for the most part and is largely ineffective as the bastion of truth that it once was. And it's now the purveyor and exporter of pornography and abortion. And friends, all of human history tells us time and again that God is going to act. And I believe we are the generation that portions of this book are written to and about. And like these men, we are called to be undefiled, as we'll see in our verses next time together. So let's pray for our nation. Let's pray for our young young people. Let's fight for them because our country, our campuses, are in deep rebellion against the true and living God. Next time we'll see how Daniel handles the temptation to compromise and he faces it without swaying from his commitment to the Lord, even under the threats of the one who was overseeing him. Let's pray together. Father, again, we're thankful for our time together tonight as we launched into this incredible book of prophecy. We thank you, Lord, for that which lie ahead of us, but thank you for laying out uh, these truths for us to understand as we begin our journey, Lord, as we march through history, seeing things that are so stunningly accurate. Some have even doubted whether this was prophetic at all, as we mentioned earlier. But we thank you, God, that we know, as we will see, that all that you wrote is going to come to pass. And all that we have seen here tonight as well gives us a reminder that the time of judgment coming upon the whole world is going to come to pass as well. And Lord, that you are patient, you are long-suffering, your mercies are new each morning, but you've told us time and again, told the world time and again, that judgment is coming, even as you told Judah and Israel. So Lord, help us to be those who go out and proclaim as a herald, the fact that Jesus has come and is coming again and is the only means by which anyone can be saved. Give us boldness, God, by the things that we study as we make our way through this book. And Lord, what an incredible thing to be in the book of Acts on Sunday in parallel. So God, I pray that you indeed stir us up to love and good works, that we would do good to all, especially to those of the household of faith, that we might, God, be seen as completely different than anything and any religion in this world. And that we might be accused of what was said of Peter and John, that we have been with Jesus. Make that so for all of us, I pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Chapter 2, we'll get into some of the prophetic aspect, but I encourage you to read the balance of chapter 1. As I said, uh, next week is family communion. Uh, the week after that, I'm not sure if, what that date is. It might be praise night. We might be uh, three weeks out before we get back in. But uh, read ahead. Uh, tremendous courage uh, displayed by these young men. And uh, it will be an encouragement to us as we visit that. And once we hit chapter 2, start looking at the statue Uh, that is fashion there. We'll get into some of the prophetic elements of the book. So let's all stand. I found the answers you need on your listening. I'll tell you the truth about God. My eyes haven't seen him. These hands never touched him. I've never seen the wind, but I felt the breeze today.